Hello, I'm Derek McGuire, a software development engineer with Amazon Web Services. And today I'll be performing a deep dive on the O3D and, and SDK feature. And here's the agenda rundown for today. We'll cover the O3D registration system, which includes uh, engine, project, and gem registration, uh, project and gem creation, as well as gem activation. Uh, we'll also go over the project building workflows, the difference between a project-centric and engine-centric workflow, uh, what the engine SDK layout is, as well as what the project game release layout is. So what is O3D as an SDK? It's the effort to distribute the Open3D engine with the necessary artifacts, binaries, include files that will allow a user to use their engine in a, to use the engine with their own projects and gems in a pre-built manner. The goal of the O3D as an SDK effort is to allow a user or a game team to assemble a game or simulation application for release to end users. Other goals for the O3D as SDK feature is to only allow uh, users to pay for linker time. The, SD, uh, the engine co source code doesn't have to be built in this particular case. Also, the engine is redistributable, uh, re uh, which is, what this means is that the SDK itself can be taken, archived, and then given to other users or members of the game development team, and they can just use that as is with a little bit of setup. Next, here's the sections of the O3D E as an SDK feature. So it consists of the following parts. The, uh, the Python package strips for configuration. It'll have the, the registration system as well as the t uh, template creation and instantiation system. Uh, more in-depth talks about the O3D Python package uh, scripts will be covered by Colin Byrne at the Code and Gems workshop later today. It also covers the project-centric workflow whereas CMake is run from the project root directory and that has the project use and adjust the engine in order to build. It adds support for external projects and external gems, which means projects and gems can be placed anywhere on the file system. And then you have the, the pre-built SDK layout for creating an, an SDK layout that can be given to other developers and our users to use a pre-built engine with. And finally, we'll cover the project game release layout, which is just a combination of the built game launcher plus the asset artifacts required to run the game. And those artifacts and game launcher itself is also redistributable for, for users. So you can have, you can create your own game release and then maybe hand it to other members of your team, maybe uh, QA or testers. So first let's start off by covering what O3D objects are. So O3D objects are located in manifest files that describe information about about themselves, so you have engine, projects, gems, templates, repositories. They're all described by O3D objects. And what an O3D object is, it's just a path on the file system with an object.json file in it. So inside the O3D re uh, repo root, there's an engine.json. For your project, there's a project.json. And for your gem, you'll have a gem.json file. And each object self-describe what contents that it distributes with it. So an engine.json comes with several gems. So you, if you would open up the O3D repo engine.json, you will see gems such as Atom, Script, Canvas, Emotion Effects. It will be self-described inside of that O3D, manif uh, O3D object file of the engine.json. And then there's also a global user a manifest file located in the user's home directory that's on a per user basis allows a user to register the location of their projects, engines, and gems. So let's start to define a little bit of terminology of the O3D E as an SDK feature. So we'll start off with an external subdirectory, and we define an external subdirectory as a folder containing a CMake list.txt. And we use an external uh, subdirectory as a hook into the CMake build generator in order to allow additional build targets to be added. And then we also have definitions for a engine, project, and gem. A an engine is just an external subdirectory that contains an engine.json file within it. A project is the same, just with a project.json file in it. 
and a gem is the same with a gem.json file within it. And then there's a template. And a template is just a directory with a, a template.json file within it as well, but it's not an external subdirectory. Uh, templates are used to define uh, structures that can be instantiated to create a project or gem. And now let's have a little bit of an overview over the O3D Python package. So it's a set of Python scripts that is uh, driven by a driver script called the O3D.py. And the code and gem workshop that Colin Byrne will be uh, presenting uh, later today will go over the commands in more detail. But here, this Python script provides, here's just a short set of, uh, short set of commands that it provides, uh, registration commands, uh, project creation, gem creation, or just uh, creation of a, a directory structure from a template, the ability to create a template out of any directory, uh, the ability to activate gems, as well as the uh, ability to query information that, are, that is registered via the register show and get register commands, and then the ability to edit the project gem and engine.json via the edit star.properties uh, command, and then finally, an ability to set the global and query the global project that is defined. And the most relevant commands are going to be the register and create project and create gem commands for using O3D as an SDK. It will be the most used commands. And each of these uh, commands can be uh, used with uh, the pre-built SDK engine as well as a source SDK engine. So let's define a little bit more registration terminology. We'll go with a, a, and define engine registration. And that's the process of mapping the engine name from the engine.json file and its location on the system until the O3D manifest.json file. This will be used later to show how the project is used to locate the engine when running in a project centric workflow, which we'll define later. Next. Let's go over a small like, example of how to like, register the engine. So we use the O3D Python package register uh, command to register an engine. And you can register an engine with the O3D manifest JSON uh, file itself. That's the one that's a per user uh, manifest. So here, in this case, we just run the O3DE scripts, uh, Python script register command, and we pass in the this engine option, which registers your current engine location into the global O3D manifest.json file. Here you'll see the, there's an engine array entry with an engine path entry that maps the name of the engine, O3DE, to its location on the file system, the O3DE uh, directory. Now let's cover some uh, project registration and we'll first by start by defining the, what it means to uh, register a project and that's the process of storing the path to the project within either the O3E uh, manifest file, which is a, on a per user uh, basis, or the engine.json file, which gets shared via the, uh, the engine itself. So there's currently only one project that's registered with the engine, that's the automated testing project that comes with the O3D engine, and that's the, uh, one of the only projects that should be registered. We recommend that projects be, get registered with the uh, global manifest on each user's machine. So here's an example of how to register the project to the, the global manifest. We run the same register command with the O3D.py scripts. You'll see these scripts have O3D.bat. That's just a small wrapper to help invoke the O3D engine installed third-party Python uh, for Unix systems such as uh, Linux and Mac. It will be O3D.sh. So if you were to uh, take these examples, just substitute .bat for .sh. And the register command here passes in the dash pp parameter or project path. And that you can specify a relative path to your, the project to register, which will be relative to the, uh, your engine root or an absolute path. And in this case, once, it, once you run those two commands, you, you can look at the O3D e manifest file. You'll see both projects are registered inside that manifest file in the project's array key. And projects, as I mentioned before, can also be registered to the engine.json file, and that can be done by passing in an additional parameter known as the dash EP parameter or engine path parameter. In this case, you, we're registering the automated testing project to the O3D engine at 
the D colon O3DE and inside the engine.json, you still have that similar projects or uh, array key, this time with the automated testing project or automated testing path inside of that project array. And next, let's cover gem registration, and that's the process of storing the path to the gem inside of either one of these uh, three manifest files, the O3D manifest file, which is a, the global per user manifest file, the engine.json file, which is, gets shared via sharing the engine, and then the project.json file, which gets shared via sharing the project. And one note about this is that a prerequisite for adding the gem to a build solution is to add it to either the engine.json or project.json, which we'll cover in the next couple of slides. So we'll start off with the, the register gem command. Because the register gem, uh, because gem can be registered with three different kinds of uh, manifest files, the O3D manifest, the project manifest, or the project.json file, and the engine.json file, there's several options to, to decide how that file gets registered. So here we have this gem called test gem that's in the, uh, on the D drive. We use the regular register command with the GP or gem path parameter, and that will register your test gem path into the global O3D manifest file. The next command uses the dash ESEP option to register that test gem to the O3D engine location of D colon O3DE. And then the third command here uses the ESPP parameter, which stands for external subdirectory project path parameter, to register the test gem with the Atom sample viewer project. Uh, for brevity, uh, the sample here illustrates that the, uh, it illustrates the registration with the Atom sample uh, viewer gem or Atom sample uh, viewer project. And you'll see all the gems get registered to a key called external subdirectories. Uh, the reason it's not under gems key is because we are, are, are able to scan over the external subdirectories, determine if that directory contains a gem.json file on it, and if it does, we use that as a gem. Otherwise, we just treat it as a regular uh, external subdirectory that we just hook into the build system. And as I mentioned before, when a gem is registered, it has to be registered with either the project.json or the engine.json to appear in the build solution. So once you register a, a gem to either one of these two uh, JSON files, it'll appear in any build solutions you create using the CMake build generator. So here, Atom Sample Viewer now is using the test gem project, or the test gem gem that was registered in the commands on the previous page. One thing to note is that registering the, uh, the gem in the O3D manifest file will only have it appear in the project manager not any of the build solutions, which I'll illustrate here, as you can see that like any gem that's in, in any of the three manifest files, O3D manifest, engine.json, or project.json, will appear in the project manager. If it's only in O3D manifest.json, it will only appear in the project manager, it will not appear in the build solution. And one thing to uh, be cognizant of is that any gem that is registered, doesn't necessarily mean it's activated. So a gem being registered just means that it's, it's hooked potentially into the build system, but not that the gem is activated. And we'll cover gem activation a little bit later. So now let's cover the project creation and, and gem creation commands of the O3D Python package. So the O3D Python package create project command is used to create a project. And the projects are created from a template that exists within the O3D repos templates directory. Uh, the engine comes with two uh, default templates. It's the default project template and the minimal project template, which the only difference between the default project template and the minimal project template is the number of gems that are, that comes with those uh, created projects. So in the minimal project templates, it comes with just the necessary gems required to use the engine. Uh, the default project template comes with a, a little bit of niceties with uh, enabling certain gems such as script canvas and emotion effects. And then we we'll go over the create gem command. It's similar to the create project command. The templates are in the same location. They're still in the engine root uh, templates directory. And we come with, again, two templates for creation of gems. We come with a default gem template, which makes a code base gem that can also contain assets. And then there's a asset only gem template, which when instantiated, will create an, a gem that only contains assets. It doesn't contain any kind of CMake hooks for uh, storing in code and or applications. 
and gems that are, are registered uh, to CMake. So gems are registered uh, within or added to CMake via us uh, scanning the project.json or engine.json for the external cell directories array key and then just adding a, a calling a CMake as cell directory command to hook that into the build system. And one thing to note, a gem again is a special case of an external subdirectory. So it's just an external subdirectory that came with a gem.json file. So that's the only uh, difference between an external subdirectory and gem. Now here's some additional notes on gems. Uh, gems, you can only set a gem active for a project, not the engine. What that means is that if you have a just a engine centric or just a engine only built. You can't have any of the engine applications such as the asset processor or editor just depend on that without, a pro without going through a project itself. And then uh, to reiterate again, registering a gem in a project.json or engine.json allows it to appear in the build solution generated by CMake. And then activating the gem means to add it as a build and runtime dependency of a project. And one thing to note, it's also possible to add a gem as a dependency of a project indirectly and that can be done via adding the gem as a, uh, the gem target as a runtime dependencies within the CMake script for that particular gem. And now let's cover gem activation. So the main features of, of activating gems are as follows. So the gem can be activated and added as a, as a dependency of the project as well as it will automatically load when applications that are associated with that project are launched. And that can be done by using the ly enable gems command. So the ly enable gem command is a CMake command that we uh, use to hook and tie in a project name to a gem name itself. And, and with that information, we say this project uses these uh, particular set of gems. And the enable gem, disable gem command as part of the O3D Python scripts can also be used to add the uh, gems to this enable gem command itself. That this is a, a, a Python wrapper which, which modifies the, uh, the file that's, that's specified to the ly enable gems command. And then the gem module targets, every gem you can, you can group its uh, module targets to variants, which are just uh, CMake aliases that can tie together to some particular build targets. So the command for doing that is the ly create alias. And we'll cover the ly create alias command right now. So here in this case, here's an example of creating a, a build variant for a gem. We have this test gem that we just defined here. It has the pow trait monolithic driven type, which just means that in non-monolithic builds, it'll build a, a DLL module target. And in monolithic builds, it'll build a static library target. It, it also adds a special property to mark that, uh, that target as a gem. And then we use the ly create alias command to give it to associate particular variants to that particular gem target. So here, this test gem has the builders, tools, clients, and servers variants associated with it. So in applications which use the builders variants, such as the asset processor, it will load this gem if that gem is enabled. The editor uh, application would use the twos variants. The game launcher would use the, uh, the client variants and the service launchers, or the server launcher would use the service variants. So let's go a, have another example of how you would activate a gem for a project. And here is like the, this is the secret sauce for how you would go about this associating your project with a gem. It's just, you just invoke your ly enable gems command you pass it the name of your project, you pass it a uh, path to the, uh, to the list of gems. This can also be uh, used with a gems uh, parameter where you can pass it the names of gems instead of passing in a file. By default, any project that's instantiated from the default project template and or the minimal project template comes with a, an enabled gems.cmake file. And that contains the default list of, of gems that can be added to uh, added or removed from. And next, now let's cover how to map an application to gem variants. So there was uh, mentioned before that you can make, you can associate a gem with a particular variant. Here is how you can get the applic an application to use those variants. So here's an example of our launcher unified 
that CMake script, which is for uh, setting up the targets for the game launcher and server launcher. And here you can use this ly set gem variant to load command to tell the game launcher to use any client's variants uh, gems and the server launcher to use any server variant gems. So what this means is that for any gems that are active for your project, if that gem has a client's variant uh, alias associated with it, the game launcher will build, add that as a build dependency and it will automatically load that. Similarly for the, the uh, server launcher, if that gem has a server's variant, the game launcher or the server launcher will add that as a dependency and automatically load it when it launches. Uh, some additional notes is that for two's variants, they're bound to the editor and for the asset processor, that's bound to the builder's variant. And next, let's cover some final notes on gems. Uh, gems that are not like explicitly active only indicates that the gem itself hasn't been added as an explicit dependency of a project. It can still be added implicitly as a indirect dependency. So for example, explicit activation of the script canvas gem will implicitly activate the graph canvas and script events gem. So if you're used to uh, using the project manager and you'll, you click on the script canvas gem, you may not see the graph canvas or script events gem get set as active. What the project manager is at this time is currently showing you is just the explicitly active gems. The script canvas, graph canvas, and the down, uh, upstream gem dependencies can still be implicitly activated. It just is currently not shown in the project manager. And the recommendation for how to go about authoring or maintaining gems is to author your gem in such a way that you describe all of your bit dependencies through CMake. So if you have some kind of AWS gem that depends on the AWS core or AWS message gem, describe those dependencies through the CMake runtime dependency system that we uh, expose through, through the, uh, our O3D uh, the CMake wrapper. And that will have it, the gem automatically be enabled when your gem is enabled. And now let's move on to the next part of the agenda where we cover the different project building workflows. So we'll start off by defining the terminology for the engine-centric workflow versus the project-centric workflow. So the engine-centric workflow is a workflow where CMake is used to build the engine and then optionally any projects that the engine decides to, or that the user decides to define by specifying the engine root as the CMake source directory in order to have uh, the engine build or specify projects to use the user has to specify the LY projects parameter and then pass in a relative path to any projects to use or an absolute path. Relative paths are taken relative to the engine root. And then a the project centric workflow is just a workflow where the CMake source directory, instead of being the engine root, is now the project root source directory. And in this workflow, the LY project parameter is not used and does not need to be specified and shouldn't be specified only one project is, can be used in this workflow, but there's several benefits with using the uh, project-centric workflow over the engine-centric workflow, which we'll define a little bit later. Here, if you look at the commands we, uh, we have, the difference between the engine-centric and project-centric workflow is that in the uh, engine-centric workflow, we have to pass in the LY projects uh, parameter to define a project to use. In the project-centric workflow, we omit that parameter, therefore making the, the CMake configuration step a little bit cleaner. And now let's cover the three ways we can go about building a project. So there's the project centric with a source engine workflow. There's the project centric with a pre-built SDK engine. And then there's the engine centric with a source engine workflow. And the project centric workflow is the workflow that we've, uh, we're recommending for users to use. And we'll explain some of the, the benefits and uh, drawbacks to each. And the following examples, we'll assume that there's two engines registered. There's an O3DE source engine that's located at D colon O3DE, and then there's a O3DE install SDK pre-built engine that will be uh, registered to D colon O3DE install. And let's go over with a project-centric with source engine, you know, workflow and the benefits and detriments look like. So this just involves running CMake with a source directory of the project root. Uh, one of the recommendations that we recommend, uh, recommend for using 
or placing your build directory in a project centric workflow is to place your build directory within the project uh, directory itself. So it will be an in source built. And the reason for that is the binaries, any binaries that are created inside of the project can scan upwards for the project.json file in order to, to automatically determine the project path. So if the asset processor or, or editor is within the project directory, you, there's no need to specify the project path parameter when double clicking on them or running them. And then the second recommendation is to place it under a folder called built. Uh, that's because the, uh, the asset processor and the git ignore file will automatically ignore those files so you don't have to worry about any build artifacts attempted to be added to either source control or that the asset processor is processing unnecessary artifacts itself. So you can see here the, the difference between the, like the benefits between uh, engine centric versus project centric here is that there's no need to specify the project path parameter. The engine application such as the editor and asset processor only needs to build the project to build dependencies and the project path can be in inadvertently overwritten by the bootstrap that set rich file. The detriment is that only one project can be built at a time and the engine is required to be registered. And next, how you use a project centric workflow with an SDK engine. Here, this is involves running CMake with a source directory of the project root again. This time we use the SDK engine, it's the same workflow. The difference and the one big benefit over using it with a project centric source engine workflow is that the engine's uh, source code doesn't have to be built. The only uh, cost that is paid is this link in time. So it's a, on an order, uh, order of magnitude faster to build your project in a project centric with uh, SDK workflow than a project centric with source engine workflow. It can be from over an hour to around minutes depending on how many uh, additional targets you have in your project. And then it has all of the same benefits and detriments of the project centric source engine workflow. Next, let's cover the engine centric with source engine workflow. This is, this time, the CMake source directory is set as the engine root. And the benefits that this has over a project centric workflow is that multiple projects can be uh, built at once. That can be done by supplying the LY projects parameter with multiple project paths. There's no need to register the engine with the L3D manifest file in order to build the project. But this workflow does have a myriad of detriments. One is that the project path has to be uh, supplied to any applications in order for them to, to use that project. So editor, asset processor, the game launcher, anything that's built has to have the project path parameter supplied to it. A pre uh, engine can't be used to speed up the build in this workflow. And if you have multiple projects enabled, the uh, engine build dependencies such as the editor and asset processor uses the aggregate of all of those gem dependencies. So you will pay for additional time if you only want to use one of your projects, uh, particular gems. And as mentioned previously, the LY projects parameter has to be specified. So here's just a difference between using the project centric versus the engine centric command. And the engine, uh, the project centric approach, the current directory is test project. Here you just specify the CMake source directory as a current directory and it'll just generate a CMake, uh, or a generate a build solution that's, uh, that will use the project centric workflow. In the engine centric workflow, the source directory here is the O3D engine location, and you have to specify the LY products parameter and pass in the path to your product in order to have the, any generated solution be able to build that project. And then let's go over a couple of bit of notes of what engine centric is. It's uh, only source engine builds are supported. Uh, engine SDK builds aren't supported. You can't uh, use a, an engine SDK build to perform an engine centric project build. That's just uh, it, not supported at, uh, at all. And then what makes it engine centric is this, the CMake source directory being the engine root. Same for project centric. What makes that project centric is the CMake source directory being the project root. And then to build any projects, the LY projects parameter has to be set. Now let's cover the final uh, agenda items, the L3D as the SDK layout. So here we'll cover the pre-built SDK layout as well as the project game release layout. And we'll start off by defining a couple of uh, bits of terminology. The pre-built engine SDK layout, which can only be created in an engine-centric workflow, is a directory 
where when you run the CMake install step, it'll copy all the necessary files to use the Open3D engine as a pre-built SDK. So it'll copy the, your headers, your pre-built uh, static libraries, the applications of the asset processing editor, as well as any additional configuration artifacts needed to, uh, to use the engine in the pre-built SDK uh, manner. And then you have your project game release layout, which can only be uh, performed in a project-centric workflow, which is a direct reproduce from running a CMake install step in the release configuration, and you're inside of a project-centric workflow, and that will just contain your, your game launcher application as well as your bundle as, uh, assets that is relocatable and runnable. And what's mean, meant by relocatable is that you can take this directory, archive it, give it to another user, and he should be able to un, uh, extract that archive and run that game launcher successfully without having to uh, perform any build steps or any additional setup related to O3D, it may require some, a, a couple of other system dependencies to be installed on that user's machine. And now let's go over the pre-built uh, engine SDK. So the O3D to, to, uh, pre-built engine SDK can be created by either uh, using the all build or install target to build the engine source. And then the CMake install target, if you were to use that manner, that will both build the engine as well as copy the SDK artifacts to an install layout directory, which by default is placed into the install directory inside of your, your engine repo. An alternative way to creating or, or copying the install artifacts is to use the CMake install command, and which will only perform the copying step without building. So here's an example of running the CMake dash dash install uh, configuration or command with the profile configuration and then specifying a custom directory to install the engine to, which is O3D install. So that, that can be used to post CMake generation time, choose where the uh, engine SDK artifacts are copied to. And then this pre-built engine is redistributable. So you can archive this uh, engine of uh, uh, SDK layout and then give it to other users or members of your team and they can just unzip that and then they have to perform a couple of other steps to set up their engine to use in their machine. The uh, this is uh, similar to what the, uh, the installer does. The installer provides some niceties such as installing the third party Python as well as registering the engine for you. But that uh, can be done uh, at the manual step by the user after they extracted the SDK on their machine. So here's a, a command of how you would go about creating a pre built engine SDK layout. We run the CMake configure step, and then you can optionally pass in these two parameters, the CMake install prefix, which will set the directory where the SDK uh, artifacts should be copied to when you run the CMake install step, and then the engine name, uh, the LY version engine name parameter, which is the engine name to use for the installed SDK once it gets installed to the SDK layout. And the install target can be used to build, uh, build and copy the SDK artifacts to the layouts. So if you just run this command of the, uh, the build command for the profile configuration and you just run the, the install target, it'll build all of the uh, engine artifacts and then copy them to the D03 install layout for that we specified during the CMA configuration step for the profile configuration only. And now we'll go over O3D as SDK how to use the uh, how to use the SDK. Once this SDK is built, as I mentioned, there's a couple of other steps in order to use it on another user's machine. Here, you have to first run the git python script, or git python batch script to install Python on the machine itself. And then afterwards, you have to register your engine in order for the, any projects that you have on your machine to use that engine. So after you run these two steps, you run git python to download Python, and then you run the O3.bat script, which runs Python to register the engine. We'll see that we have, instead of our O3D manifest file, two engines registered, the O3D source engine at D colon O3D, and the O3D SDK engine at O3D install, and it, ha it has the engine name of O3D install that we set previously as part of the LY version engine name. The engine name is just that uh, the engine name uh, field inside of the engine.json, so it can always be manually modified in that manner. So next, we'll go over how to you know, create and build a project using the O3D 
or create a project using the SDK itself. So once you have the SDK set up, it can be used just like the source engine. You can use the O3DE Python script, create project command to create a project. You can configure the project the same, uh, in the same manner in which you uh, configured it using a project-centric engine source workflow. And you can build a project using just the, either the CMake uh, build wrapper or opening the generated build solution inside of your idea of choice. Here, the build a project will show that we're building the, the newly created MindStar project and the editor launcher in the profile configuration, and that will build the game launcher. And then it will take the editor target and build any of its dependent gems. Because the, in the pre built SDK, the editor already exists, it's already built. We just have to specify the editor target to notify the build system that it needs to build its dependent gems that the project can additionally add. And here's some tips about the SDK layout creation. Uh, when you perform an SDK layout creation using the, uh, the, by running the install target, you can only build one configuration at a time. So most examples show uh, that an SDK layout configuration is built in profile configuration. Other configurations can be added to the same SDK layout by specifying a different configuration such as debug and profile. So if you want to add debug, specify dash dash config debug. You need to add release, specify dash dash config release, and that's how you can make a more complete SDK layout. So here's a, an example of like how to configure the SDK engine for, uh, or uh, configure uh, a project, your, your engine source engine, with the, my install project that was just created using the SDK. Once we did, uh, do that configuration, we'll see a, a project that gets generated that has the aggregate of both the engine and project build targets. Here you can see it contains the engine code and gems directory, as well as the my install uh, project uh, build targets. In a project-centric source engine workflow, we have to register the MyInstall project with the source engine itself. Remember, MyInstall project was created using the SDK engine. Here, we run the register script inside of the source engine, and we specify the, project, the MyInstall project path, and it will register that source engine under the engine key in the project.json file. So you can see here, the O3D is set as the engine to use here. And here, if you just run CMake from the source directory of the uh, the MyStar project, this will have it run in a, in a uh, project centric workflow. It'll also contain the aggregate of the project and engine uh, artifacts, or project and engine build targets. So he, again, it looks similar to the engine's uh, centric workflow. You'll have both your code and gems uh, folders from the, the engine, and you'll have your MyStar folders from your, your project. And then finally, we'll cover a project-centric SDK workflow of how to, how to use that using the, uh, that project created from the SDK. So in this case, we'll run the O3D Python script from the SDK location of O3D install, and we'll supply the my install project as the, uh, the path to register. If, and afterwards, if you open up the project.json file for that, you'll see the engine is set to O3D install. But in this time, when you generate a CMake, or when you use CMake to generate a build project for that, it would only contain the build targets for the project. It would not contain the build targets for the engine because the engine uh, build products are already pre-built at that point. So it's a dramatically uh, reduced set of targets a user will have to deal with. It also means that if you perform an all built on your particular project at this uh, case, it'll be a lot, a lot faster. So as I mentioned, order of magnitude is faster. It could take you over an hour to build the engine depending on your machine specs to minutes. And let's move on to the project game release layout. So a project game release layout is just a directory structure that contains the game launcher and the assets necessary to run the launcher outside of the developer's environment. And this can be uh, run or created by running the install target and a release configuration. So let's go over the steps of how to create a project game release layout. So there's two phases to create a project game release uh, layout. One is first to process all the assets for your game project. So you would use the uh, uh, CMake uh, command to generate a non-monolithic 
build uh, workflow setup. And here you'll just run from your, uh, this release project directory the CMA command without the AOI monolithic option that would generate a non-monolithic solution. And then you just built for the profile configuration the project name that assets targets. And that will build the asset processor and process all of the uh, assets necessary to run the game. And then the second phase is to create a monolithic build uh, solution that you can then use to run the, or you can run the install target there to first build the game launcher and create the pack files out of the asset cache that was created in the previous uh, phase. So in this case, the, uh, we make a, a different CMake built directory. Previously it was Windows VS 2019, now it's Windows Mono. And then we pass in the LY monolithic game parameter and we set it to one to say that we, we want to use that monolithic configuration. And then here we just uh, run the config or we pass, it, or we, or we build the install target with the config option. And what that would do is that would uh, build all of the artifacts that inside of that release project's game solution. And it will also take the asset cache and add them to a pack file. And then locate them into a single directory structure that can just be taken by the user and uh, archived and given to other users or members of, of a game team. So, once these two phases are performed, you should have a project game release layout that looks similar to as follows. You will see a, your, the game launcher application, a uh, cache directory which, which should contain all the assets needed to run that game, and then any DLLs that can't be uh, statically linked into the, the game launcher application itself. And it will be located within the, uh, the, your install layout directory that you can specify via the CMake install prefix what you configure in a project-centric workflow. And that's it for the deep dive in O3D as an SDK.